Hello, welcome back to Writing Women, the show where I talk about the women who exist in fiction and the people who created them. I am so sorry if you can hear noise in the background. I am now in a one bedroom apartment and my dog is chewing on a bone and I don't have the heart to take it away from her. The whole Writing Women thing is an increasingly nebulous concept that I can kind of stretch to fit whatever I want on this channel. I don't have all of my stuff set up, so if you see me look down, it's because I'm I'm looking at what I have written down. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm breaking the illusion. I'm, I am reading from a script right now. While I was re-watching the show that I want to talk about today with a plan to talk about it on here anyway, a Sarah Zed video came out and it was about geek culture in the 2010s. And in it, she briefly talks about some Joss Whedon shows and mentions how nobody should ever get into the show Dollhouse. Well, first off, what a coincidence. I was actually struggling with how I wanted to approach this video until watching hers kind of helped me work through how I was feeling about this show. That one line just made me think about what in the show made it climb into my brain and just stay there. Because unfortunately, I did get into Dollhouse. At least I tried to. Since nobody that I follow has really talked about Dollhouse at all, I'm able to give my pure opinion of it rather than an opinion that's been colored by someone else that I have watched talk about it before. So that's nice. Today, I'm going to make you listen to me talk about the show for however long this winds up being. This will kind of function as a retrospective of Joss Whedon's most forgotten about show, considering what we know about him as a person and the cultural environment of the show. Is this going to be a Dollhouse is good slash bad actually video? Well, no. Not to put the cart before the horse or anything, but the end of this video is gonna kind of conclude that Dollhouse is pretty mid with some interesting elements and a lot of bad ones. It's inoffensive at most and kind of confusing, misogynistic, and poorly executed at worst. I won't be saying that Dollhouse is scum or trash or anything like that. In fact, there is a lot about the show that I enjoy. Spoilers ahead for the entirety of Dollhouse. I would imagine that you, constant viewer, would be aware that there are going to be spoilers ahead, but just in case. Stop right now and watch it if you have any desire at all to see this show and not have every single big reveal of the plot absolutely ruined for you. It's on Hulu, and though I can't say that it's a phenomenal show, it might be worth a watch for you. At least before you hear somebody complain about it for an hour plus and maybe have that color your opinion of what you're getting into. Or if you're just a fan of Eliza Dushku and Alan Tudyk and Amy Acker and all of the other great actors that are in it. The only structure that this video is going to have is I'm going to go through season one and two separately. I have to split it like that because the second season feels like a completely different show from the first. Coming up, everything that I mention about a character or a plot development, unless otherwise stated, is going to be how everything is done in season one. And then I will specify when I'm moving on to season two. Let's talk about Dollhouse. Content warning for sexual abuse, trafficking, torture, a few other things. This show does get pretty gross, uh, so be ready for that. Dollhouse is a 2009 show created by Joss Whedon and starring Eliza Dushku. It takes place at the Los Angeles Dollhouse, one of many locations around the world where human dolls wait to be contracted out on engagements. These dolls, referred to in the show as actives, are ostensibly people who have signed a contract with the dollhouse to spend a few years as actives and then essentially wake up one day from a long nap, not remembering any of it, and walking away with more money than they could ever have imagined. They never have to work again a day in their life. The whole contract thing is used to hand wave away any concerns that people in universe have over the ethics of this type of thing. Technically, none of them are victims of trafficking or slavery or anything because they signed a contract and therefore consented. And they're supposed to get a payday at the end, so technically it's not slave labor. But of course, by the end of season one, we see that that is not exactly true. Many actives were coerced into their service with the dollhouse. Alpha, an escaped active imprinted with dozens of personalities at once, was a prisoner when he was made an active. Victor, a combat veteran suffering from crippling PTSD. 
The main character didn't even consent to it on her own terms. She was trying to take down the dollhouse's parent company and got caught. This shady parent company is the Rossum Corporation. They are your standard world-dominating corporation with its hands in a bunch of different science pies. In the first season, we also constantly hear about a place called The Attic, a place used to threaten employees and actives as a form of punishment. It's where dolls who are broken past their ability to be used are sent. It's also where they will send an average person who steps out of line. We later find out that once you go to the attic, you generally don't come back. So even people who freely sign themselves over to the dollhouse might wind up there with no hope of returning to their lives, essentially killing them. The show doesn't endorse the behavior or anything, but it does not go very far in condemning it either. They will say, oh, this is a bad thing to do, and then do it anyway. And then it never really comes back around to exposing the hypocrisy of what they're doing, the consequences of their actions, and really making them deal with it in any way. Dollhouse isn't the first science fiction property to use this concept of programmable human beings, and it for sure was not the last. There is a lot that can come from a concept like this. In Dollhouse, the first season kind of goes for this case of the week style, where each episode is a different genre. We've got one that is a thriller where Eliza Dushku's Echo, the main character, is rented to be the perfect date whose ultimate purpose is to sleep with, then be hunted down by the rich thrill seeker who paid for her time. Another episode is a heist gig where she is a cool, safe-cracking mastermind. All of these weekly outings for the viewer kind of function as a way to ogle Eliza Dushku as she dresses hot and does cool things while one or two characters shake their heads and briefly mention how if you think about it, this whole setup is kind of messed up and basically slavery. The show's intro is a series of brief snippets where we see Echo getting dressed up and smoldering into the ether. In their doll state, the Los Angeles actives live in what amounts to an underground bunker fashioned into the fanciest day spa you've ever seen. They do yoga, arts and crafts, and listen to soothing music all the time. They are kept relaxed like this because it would be intensely traumatic for them to interact with anything loud or negative while in this blank slate state. Though here is where we come to my first real frustration with the show that jumps out from the very first episode. What was the reason for Echo to be styled this way when she's supposed to be an adult-sized person with a baby brain? The male actives get to wear loose sweatpants and shirts, but God forbid we don't see the women in a full face of makeup with a glossy lip in their tight-fitting, low-cut, strappy tops showing off their perky chest. It really undermines the show's already limp efforts to address the darker implications of the doll's existence largely as sex slaves, when even in their doll state, the women absolutely must look totally perfect and sexy at all times. If I can't see most of their body for every episode, what am I even watching the show for? The LA Dollhouse is run by Adele DeWitt, and honestly, she's one of the best parts about the show. Olivia Williams pulls off being the steely career woman while also showing a lot of vulnerability. Unfortunately, the character of Adele is a retread of the woman who gave up having a satisfying social life and fulfilling romantic life to be a successful businesswoman trope. It is a trope that I am intensely bored of and was already bored of in 2011 when I first watched Dollhouse. In one of her more vulnerable moments, we see that Adele is the true Mrs. Lonely Hearts client. She secretly contracts the doll Victor to basically be her perfect partner for a while before sending him back to the house. She does so pretty regularly because she's so lonely, but eventually ends this secret dalliance largely because of her shame. Each of the dolls has a handler, someone the dolls are programmed to recognize and feel safe around. They are given key phrases that trigger a response from the dolls, the most important of which being would you like a treatment, which is meant to get the doll under control during an engagement so they can be brought back into the house for their wife. Echo's handler early on in season one is Boyd Langton. Boyd is, well, we'll get to that once we talk about season two. Boyd is one of the best parts about season one, even though much of his character's purpose is to stop somebody and ask them about the morality of what they're doing. Nearly every episode has a moment where the scene focuses in on Boyd talking to someone and pointing out how, if you think about it, all of this slavery stuff is kind of messed up. Then it's just sort of brushed off, but he keeps his thinky face on, so we know that he doesn't exactly buy it. The handlers have very little oversight in the house. One episode attempts to address the power dynamics and the vulnerable position the dolls are in when one of them is raped by her handler, repeatedly. The active in question is Sierra, and we will get to her more later and why this whole episode doesn't sit right with me. Back on the subject of handlers, it is lightly acknowledged that the power dynamics of these relationships kind of suck, 
but then it immediately moves past any discussion of it. The handler who was assaulting his active is the only handler other than Boyd who we really get to know at all, and the show punishes him by having a sleeper active take him out. Thus, we are left with Boyd, a good guy who just wants to take care of Echo. It is not the system that is bad, you see. It is the individual people within the system who are taking advantage of it who are the bad ones. Topher is the tech guy at the dollhouse. He's your standard nerdy weeding character. He's witty and says funny things and acts silly. He's assisted sometimes by Ivy. She isn't in most episodes, even in the background, and when she is in one, it seems that she almost exclusively exists to have Topher explain things to her and talk down to her. Ivy's presence in the show has a very backup effect feel. If you've watched the best show of the 2000s, Veronica Mars, this will be something you've likely noticed too in that show. Backup is the Mars family dog. He's a very good boy, and the name is meant to be a joke. When Veronica or her private eye father, Keith Daddy Mars, go out into a potentially dangerous situation, they make sure to bring Backup. Backup as in the dog. Get it? It's, it's funnier in the show. I'm, I'm so sorry. One of the funniest things about the dog is how Backup does not exist at all unless he is out with one of the Mars family on an adventure. During the many scenes per episode where they are in their apartment, he isn't lounging around on the couch. There's no dog bed they walk past, no bags of dog food, nothing but this admittedly cool as hell poster on the wall indicates a dog anywhere. My theory is that Backup actually exists within the poster and whenever they need him, they summon him from the two-dimensional world. And that's basically Ivy and Dollhouse. She exists only when Topher needs someone to explain things to. She does not exist or have any character outside of her interactions with him. In fact, there doesn't seem to be much of any staff at the house except the ones I mention here. You'll occasionally see random extras in the background and they will reference other staff offhand, but unless they are being used in that specific episode, they tend to not exist. The only exception being the frequent shots of the actives wandering around like zombies while Boyd or Adele or whoever talk about them. It contributes to making the world feel very empty. Like there isn't much going on outside what we are specifically shown. Characters don't have much to them outside what they do at the dollhouse. Topher talks about nerdy stuff, but we don't often see him doing nerdy stuff outside what he does for his job. In one episode where he makes Sierra into his best friend for a day, we get a very short bit of characterization where they play video games and hang out, then it's over. He's back to being the nerdy guy who we are just supposed to understand as nerdy because he makes references to things that we recognize as nerdy interests. That being said, Topher is a fun character, and the little we know about him outside his role in the dollhouse helps to reinforce the dollhouse's stated goal. Everybody has something they need. Adele's need for companionship, unfortunately, falls into some really annoying tropes for women in positions of power on screen. Topher's is a bit less sinister in tone. He's a lonely introvert who wants a friend. Someone who understands him and just wants to hang out and be there for him. It's kind of sad and is intentionally one of the least morally confused uses of the dolls. This is the idyllic version of what the dolls agree to, fulfilling a need and not being put through the ringer to do so. It also helps to soften the blow of the hardcore, world-ending human rights violations Topher directly causes. He's just a sad and lonely smart boy. This contracts with other engagements where the client is also a sad boy, but still uses the active as a sex doll. This guy's wife died on the day he planned to surprise her with a house he had bought for them after years of her supporting him through financial failures. Echo is made into his wife. She comes home, he lives out his fantasy, and gets to imagine his late wife is finally happy before sleeping with her and sending her back. Even in the first season, this man is made out to be sympathetic. Sure, he's using the body of someone who can't consent, but he just misses his wife so much. This show engages in some hardcore both sidesing with this recurring point. Can we really say if it was good or bad? To me, it seems like the show even lands on it's good. I'll break my self-imposed season rule to bring up that this character comes back in season two. Alpha is killing any client Echo has ever been programmed to be in love with. This guy comes back and we find out he's finally moved on. Echo becomes his late wife again and tells him it's okay and she loves him, but he deserves to be happy. 
She helps him move on. All those times he paid to have his way with someone who couldn't consent were in service of a greater cause, and now he's a whole person. In the conversation he has with the FBI, he tells this sob story. The counter is that he still sleeps with the doll after living out his fantasy reunion, and he laughingly says, well, I'm sure I'm in need of some serious moral spankitude, but guess who's not qualified by? It's so gross to try and make us feel bad for this person who is using the bodies of non-consenting people instead of going to therapy or grief counseling or something. He is made to look like kind of a jerk, but that characterization is completely undermined by how much the show wants us to feel bad for this poor man who only takes advantage of women because he's broken and needs to be fixed. Paul Ballard is an FBI agent who is tracking the dollhouse. Specifically, he is trying to find it because he becomes obsessed with a girl named Caroline. Caroline is Echo. Through a series of events, he gets inside the dollhouse and nearly exposes it. He winds up agreeing to be employed by them as Echo's new handler under the condition that they free the act of November from her contract early. November was on a long-term surveillance engagement as Paul's neighbor Melly, and they formed a relationship. He still has complicated feelings for her. The girl he knew wasn't real. She was created to love him. His feelings for Caroline slash Echo get mixed up in all this, and he sacrifices his own moral stance and career to be a hero for two women at the same time. November signed with the dollhouse to escape devastating grief at the loss of her child. When she leaves the dollhouse, that grief has been cured. The other two actives that are major players in season one, I have already briefly mentioned. Victor is a war veteran who signs up to get away from his PTSD, and Sierra is, well... Oh boy. Sierra is an artist who had the misfortune of being desired by someone high up in Rossum. He tries to bribe her into loving him, but she isn't having it. Not really into the corporate douche who thinks money will impress her. So he has her forcibly committed to a psych ward where he forces medication on her that causes symptoms of schizophrenia. He then passes her over to the dollhouse where Topher is excited to cure the mind of this person who is not in possession of their full mental faculties and therefore, even without all that other stuff, could never consent to what is done to her. The guy wants her as an active so she can never again say no to him. I'm not sure why they picked Sierra to be the constant victim of this kind of violence. What it seems like is they didn't want big, strong white woman Echo to be victimized that way while meek, kind Asian woman Sierra needs strong men to protect her. Echo is the hero trying to save everyone, so she has to be the one to save herself anytime she is in danger on assignment. Sierra is a sensitive soul, and so obviously she would be the best one to traumatize repeatedly, so we don't let the audience think Echo is weak enough to be victimized that way. Her handler is the bad egg who decides that raping his charge is totally fine, and in fact, what did they expect? You put a bunch of stone foxes with no willpower and no memory running around naked. Did you think this would never happen? It feels incredibly gross to focus so much of this on one character. Sierra is the living example that the abuse is a systemic problem, and yet the show never does anything past addressing the single people who harm her, like her handler. When Adele and Topher eventually find out the truth behind Sierra's situation, they are again angry at the person who directly caused this, instead of recognizing the system is creating an environment where this abuse can flourish. The man who puts Sierra in the house constantly requests Sierra for engagements, where she enthusiastically loves him and sleeps with him. It is creating a horrific cycle of trauma for her. Adele doesn't even consider just letting Sierra go and giving her back her life after she learns this big secret. Despite knowing full well that Sierra never consented to be in the dollhouse and also had been horrifically abused constantly since arriving. They put her right back in the chair after she kills the man who took her freedom with a half-hearted promise that once her contract is up, she shouldn't remember the act of killing him. And mind you, this is all after the thing with her handler where Adele shows what an ally she is by having the handler killed before putting Sierra right back in these compromising positions and never acknowledging that maybe the existence of the house is the problem. Even with the main antagonist of the whole show being this evil corporation, they tiptoe around the idea of outright saying the abuse is a systemic problem and is instead the fault of specifically evil people and this specifically evil company. You can't write a story that ultimately ends with a young adult novel style dystopia of butchers, dumb shows, and actuals where our heroes eventually fix the big bad thing and undystopia their world but never fully commit to tearing down a corrupt system. Instead, it is tearing down corrupt individuals and trying to repair the damage they specifically did to return the status quo of their world. 
A huge part of season one is that the active start evolving. Technically, it all started with Alpha before the season even began, but then Echo picks it up before spreading it to the other actives. In their doll state, they are supposed to not remember anything, complete blank brain except recognizing staff at the house. They start to form friendships with other actives. Victor and Sierra fall in love and remember each other even when imprinted for an engagement. This leads to a pretty funny scene where Victor tries to tell Adele that he's breaking up with her during her last attempt at a fling with him before he's released after serving his time at the dollhouse. Sierra is haunted by memories of her various assaults, even in her doll state. This isn't supposed to happen, and it starts to bleed over more and more in her programming. Echo starts breaking through her engagement parameters and finding unique ways to solve problems. Agent Ballard nearly brings the house down before switching sides. Dollhouse security chief Lawrence Dominic, who hates Echo and tries to kill her, is revealed to be working for the government and is put in the attic against his will. To be tortured until the end of time, presumably. Alpha returns and kidnaps Echo before imprinting her with all of her personalities at once while putting the Caroline mind into the body of some random person. He tries to get them to talk to each other and have Echo metaphorically or literally end her own original self so she can evolve as a hive mind and be his perfect partner. We find out that Dr. Saunders, the mild-mannered woman who treats the actives, is actually Alpha's early victim, but that's not all. She used to be an active, codenamed Whiskey. Alpha cut up her face around the time he flew off the handle and left the dollhouse in chaos. He killed the original Dr. Saunders, so Whiskey was made into a doctor as a permanent replacement for their last one. This all seems like it might be going somewhere exciting, but it isn't. The season just kind of ends there. The final episode wasn't even aired initially, so audiences left off at a moment with a lot of potential, but no follow through. On streaming or on a DVD release back in the day, you could watch the groundbreaking episode 12 titled Epitaph 1. It's a time skip forward 10 years to the year 2019 and the world is in chaos. Well, it was a chaotic year, but definitely not a cool sci-fi kind of chaos. In this 2019, there has been a massive wipe of the population's minds and remote imprinting on people without the need for the active's configuration. Previously, to be able to use imprinting technology, the person's brain had to have stuff put in it to make the tech work. This breakthrough in research meant Rossum could just wipe the whole world and rule over the ruins. People were turned into crazed zombies slaughtering everything in sight or wandering blank slates incapable of comprehending anything. A group of refugees retaining their actual identities stumble into the remains of the L.A. dollhouse and a blank whiskey guides them to an imprint of Caroline. One of them is given the imprint and this new Caroline leads them away to a place they think will be safe from technology. No real resolution except to tease you with the way that we know this society is going. I get what they were going for here, but functionally it takes away from any suspense you would feel in season two by telling you exactly what things will have to come to pass to get there. When season two starts with Echo just doing an average job again, it feels boring. This case of the week thing isn't working anymore because we're just waiting for the collapse we know most of the details about already. There's a lot of lore surrounding Dollhouse. And by lore, I mean rumors that circulate online and a lot of people just take it as fact because it feels right. Most of the rumors about season two are some version of he found out about the show getting canceled halfway through season two and that's why it's so bad. That's not technically true, but it's also not entirely untrue. What happened to Dollhouse is the first season was ordered and it underperformed. The show had really low viewership pretty consistently, and the finale wasn't even shown at the end. Joss Whedon allegedly had planned out five seasons worth of content, only for him to be unsure of even getting a season two. This is probably why the first season feels so safe. Very detached episodes loosely strung together with threads of an overarching story that maybe could pay off later. He got a season two, but definitely would not get a season three due to the previously mentioned underperforming. So the show became this roller coaster that would have to go through all of its ups and downs and loop-de-loops at a breakneck speed. Oh, Topher comes up with an invention that can remote wipe an active and has potential for dangerous uses? Well, Adele is going to steal those plans and give them to the new executive Rossum has put in her place to try and get on their good side. Except what's this? She was actually working for the good guys all along, and it was a big act to get Echo into the attic so she could try and get access to Rossum's secrets. 
They try to stretch this out over the course of a few episodes, making the viewer think that Adele has turned on them, but it doesn't really work because her heel turn comes out of nowhere and she is suddenly over the top, mustache twirlingly evil. I don't even think it makes sense to purposely give the most dangerous weapon directly to the bad guy in some long game ploy that isn't even likely to get any usable information, being that nobody actually knows what's happening in the attic. The show tries to do the same rug pull with Caroline. Bennett Halverson is introduced for the sole purpose of being a girl that Topher could start word vomiting about how hot and cool she is and how super weird it is for a girl to be a scientist. These geeky, smart, funny guys in Joss Whedon's shows always strike me as the self-inserts. So it doesn't bode well that they also tend to be casually misogynist. This girl scientist went to college with Caroline and was seemingly betrayed by her, so she tortures Echo as a form of revenge. We see the memory from Bennett's point of view, and it's a comic book villain scene where Caroline literally leaves her to die in a burning lab, while spouting off a line about not wanting to get caught. It's left dangling that Caroline may actually have been a selfish person who didn't care who was hurt in her wake while she goes after Rossum. But this goes against all our previous characterization of her, so there's no mystery here. When we ultimately see the full version of that memory, it's no surprise that Caroline was still just being a hero and a good friend. That's one of the personality traits that at this point, they've beaten to death trying to show the audience how no matter what, Caroline is just special and a natural leader who cares about everyone. There's not enough time in this one season to try and set these things up properly as a potential twist or even a character really going to the bad guy's team. As a result, many of the story beats feel rushed at best and confusing at worst. Epitaph 2 closes out the season with new Caroline and her pals finding original Caroline slash Echo. They successfully undystopia the dystopia by Topher's discovery of a way to return everyone to normal. Paul Ballard is killed in the final push to return to the dollhouse, and the series ends with Echo imprinting herself with his last brain skin so he can live forever in her head with all her other personalities in this creepy empty room where they can just talk forever, I guess. Forget about how weird that last part is. Focus on how much of that had to happen in a single episode. Alpha's a good guy now for some reason, even though he's directly responsible for causing more of the changes in active tech that led us here. Sierra and Victor have a child but are separated because Victor has become obsessed with modding his brain and runs a Mad Max-style crew of outlaws. Sierra is trying to be a nice trad wife and mother who doesn't want Victor's tech around their kid. So much of this would have been more interesting to watch happen in real time than pretty much anything else that was put in season two's world-ending story. While in the attic, Echo finds Clyde Randolph, one of the co-founders of Rossum. His partner put him in there years ago and took over the company with an imprint of Clyde that was modified to be compliant. The attic is revealed to be a Matrix-style supercomputer type thing where human brains are used for processing power to tackle difficult problems. The people were all connected into a global network, so Clyde jumps from person to person, killing them. Ending their lives removes a tiny bit of Rossum's ability to figure out complex issues. Mr. Dominic is here too because he's still in the attic. He's here for like two episodes and he joins Clyde to help him take out Rossum's people processors. Echo escapes with this information and oh wow, Adele was with them all along, I'm very surprised. They need to give her Caroline's imprint finally and the new composite person Echo must wrestle with the idea of meeting her original self. Caroline met with the Rossum founders before being sent to the dollhouse and they need to remember that meeting and who the founder is. Oh, turns out of all people, Papa Bear Boyd is Rossum's co-founder, and Whiskey is no longer Dr. Saunders. She is one of the many bodies of the other guy, Evil Clyde Randolph. Boyd has been hanging out to try and create the perfect evolved family for his apocalyptic vision of the world. This is probably one of the most confusing bits of season two, and for good reason. Boyd wasn't supposed to be the villain, but because the show was ending, Whedon wanted a villain they could defeat to wrap things up. He also wanted it to be someone the audience had an emotional attachment to, and basically picked Boyd because, wow, wouldn't it be messed up if Boyd was a bad guy all along, even though every bit of his characterization in season one was about his moral issues with the dollhouse and genuine concern for actives? These don't even feel like the same characters in some cases, and in others, the show wastes valuable time trying to fake us out with them maybe being bad guys. When I first watched the show, I was convinced that the Boyd thing was another fake out. 
an attempt at a scenario where they make him so cartoonishly evil that by the end of the show, they'll pull the rug out and be like, aha, he was a good guy all along. They've done it so much at this point that it would follow in the trend of what the show was already doing. And then it wasn't. This was almost my, there's a secret good episode of Sherlock that makes the horrible final season good somehow hill to die on. The ending didn't feel earned and so it left an even worse impression than the first season. Too much concern for wrapping up the story and not enough concern for what would actually make a good story. The second season feels more cohesive as a show with a creative vision than the first in some ways, but it also feels like a totally different show. The shift feels similar to the difference between seasons one and two of Supernatural, but without the vision of where the show was ultimately going at the end of that planned story arc. It was also missing the confidence in storytelling that would be needed to tell the story that needs to be told here versus the one that's easier to tell to wrap things up. Dollhouse was built up as a project around its lead. And it's not that she doesn't have the chops to pull this kind of thing off. It's just that nearly every other character on the show is more interesting and magnetic than her as Echo or Caroline. Something about most of Echo's imprints just seem very similar or dull. All the other actives have more range than what she is allowed to have. Maybe it's a byproduct of needing nearly everything she does to look hot. I don't know. All I can say is that when Echo was imprinted as Kiki in season two, episode three, it felt like all her other imprints. Not that she isn't good or portraying that character well. It's that when Victor had Kiki swapped into him, he stole the whole episode with his full body acting and mannerisms, something he does often. Same imprint, but more memorable coming from him. Now you may think that's just because it's a buff guy acting like a hot college girl, but a similar thing happens in season one when Sierra is imprinted with the same personality as Echo. Even the girl who Alpha imprints with Caroline's mind sells me Caroline more than Dushku does. It's not that she's bad, it's just that when she's the default that everyone else is playing off of, they kind of stand out more. And that's a bad thing for the main character of your show. That alone didn't herald the end of the show before it could really get going, but it sure didn't help when you add that Dollhouse was so shy about its tougher themes and so didn't really do anything with them. In the beginning, I mentioned that Sarah Zed video. In it, she also talks about Firefly, specifically how Firefly is remembered the way it is because it was canceled before it could reach its full potential, before it could go on to just be an okay show. I would argue that Dollhouse is remembered the way it is, and by that I mean not really remembered at all, because we got to see what a second season would do. We saw the potential that the show could have had get fumbled when they made a really weird second season. I will be the first to admit that I used to be a Whedon stan. I was already in my early 20s when Tumblr nerd culture was at its height. One of my most reblog posts was one of those ones where you have like a song playing and there's a bunch of gifs. And so like you scroll through them and the song's playing over them. And it was a set of gifs of the Avengers actors. And the song was the parody song by Willem Belly of Drag Race fame, uh, Love You Like a Big Schlong. My early adulthood was very cool, is what I'm trying to get across here. If Dollhouse had ended after Epitaph 1, it would have been a kind of interesting show that got cut short before it could really explore all of these heady concepts that we see in the future hellscape. It had problematic aspects, but doesn't everything. Instead, it was a show cut mercifully short because two whole seasons didn't even approach dealing with moral implications or showing us how we devolve into that dystopian future. How does the collapse happen on a societal level outside this single house and this one set of Rossum employees? It just kept listing more things that were happening that could be explored further and then moving on, like people passing animals at the zoo. You look at the cool wolves, then walk on. You check out the orangutans, then you move on. Maybe you hang out to watch the spectacle of them sadly eating their own feces because they are horrifically bored with their existence, and then you still eventually move on and look at the polar bear or something. The show constantly approaches the general vicinity of asking questions about the nature of humanity and what makes you you, 
But then it gets distracted and gives us more of Echo looking hot and sad while everyone around her frowns and says, well, I just wanted to explicitly state that we are asking questions here about the nature of consciousness and morality and identity. Unless it's the episode about Sierra getting revenge on the man who turned her into the dollhouse and Adele and Topher finally having to grapple with the reality of what they're doing. But then that episode ends with Sierra in the chair and we go right back to Echo being hot and sad as the main attraction. They pretend to be asking these serious questions and then just stop. It's like going to a restaurant for dinner, sitting down and ordering food. It arrives, you take a nice long look at it, maybe sniff it a little, you get up, you go home, and you eat a Hot Pocket while standing in front of your microwave in your kitchen. That's season two of Dollhouse, a Hot Pocket that looks warm on the outside, but has a disgusting frozen center on the inside. If you're interested in some spooky sci-fi that at least tries a little harder with the same concept, then just play Soma. Spoilers, I guess, for Soma's general concept. It's a game about a man who has his brain scanned for medical purposes. At the moment he is scanned, he wakes up in a strange science lab at the bottom of the sea far in the future after an apocalyptic event that ended the human race. There are terrifying monsters and talking robots that used to be people, or are people, depends on your view of what constitutes life and personhood, which is what Dollhouse seemed to be going for sometimes. In Soma, though, you are an active participant and have to make choices throughout based on whether or not you consider any consciousness life, even if that consciousness is an identical copy of your own. Your brain scan was used after your death as the basis of research on artificial intelligence technology, giving them a working brain as a starting point for how to create independent thought. You are one of the original scans and people recognize your name as if it's a computer program they've all played with in the lab at school. Because it kind of is, right? A personality is a program that dictates how our machines behave. So if you have to switch to a new body and the only way is to be copied inside it, is the new copy the real you or is the original? What even is the original when this original is also just a copy? Which body did the you that we are controlling wind up in when you tossed the coin and copied yourself into a new place? At the end of the game, the you that we are playing copies themselves into the digital world of the Ark, the last bastion of humanity. And another copy of yourself is left to rot away or be killed at the bottom of the sea. I'm bringing up Soma because I'm trying to get the gamers on my channel by mentioning video games as often as possible. Some of the issues come from Dollhouse being a network television show pre the boom in television content that came with Netflix originals. Joss Whedon would have people believe it is entirely because of network meddling that the show couldn't really do much with its darker concepts. And it is true that had this show been produced even five years later, it could have really gone hard on them. Unfortunately, that wasn't ever going to happen on a show that was pre-Game of Thrones. It also wasn't really going to happen with someone like Joss Whedon at the helm. To talk about Joss Whedon here, we have to talk about Justice League. During the investigation into Joss Whedon's conduct on set, Buffy and Angel actress Charisma Carpenter came forward in support of Justice League's Ray Fisher. She opened up publicly about Whedon's abuses of power on set and the effects that it still has on her to this day. He allegedly publicly verbally abused her and privately accused her of trying to ruin the show by getting pregnant, apparently asking her if she planned to keep the baby and then firing her after she gave birth. Longtime fans knew that something had gone down on the set of Angel, but the details of whatever happened were never made this glaringly public before. Many of her colleagues spoke out in support of her and a few chose to remain on the fence and say nothing. Not a great look for this dude who also wrote an episode in Dollhouse about how the experience of motherhood fundamentally changed a woman on a deeper level than conscious memory. The mother instinct is so powerful and destructive that Echo ruins an engagement and further evolves away from her active state when she thinks she's experiencing being a mother. That's one of the reasons I have wanted to talk about this show for so many years. Every time we find out that one of these popular media figures is actually just a jerk or a bigot, there's a conversation about separating the art from the artist, blah, blah, blah. Then when we actually look a bit more closely at the things they created, we can see that on some level, some of this stuff was already there in plain sight. Not always, but often enough that a blanket statement of separating the art from the artist never sits well with me. It is ultimately unproductive to engage with something as what you think it should have been rather than what it is. That being said, some things are really difficult to avoid that when talking about. This could have been an interesting show if a million little things were just done better. 
It could have been a feminist look about how corporate power structures dehumanize women for the use of their bodies. Or even further, it could take an intersectional approach to how women of color like Sierra receive a combination of oppression based in perceptions of their race as well as their gender presentation. But it wasn't. Mary Sue put out an article in 2021 about how Dollhouse indicates Whedon's attitude toward women. And though I think it's overly generous in saying that the show, quote, explored ideas about self and immortality and technology, the article is otherwise on the money. Dollhouse explores those things the way a kid dresses up like a sailor and explores their backyard. Say that you're exploring all day, but ultimately you're still relying on the safety and comfort of familiar places and not stepping into the potentially dangerous unknown. With his treatment of the pregnant Charisma Carpenter held up next to how he wrote the primal destructiveness of the mother's instinct in Dollhouse, it kind of starts to make sense why he would just write an episode that's so strange and all over the place. That's just who he is as a person and what he believes coming through in his work. So what's the point of this video? Mostly to get out all the stuff that I think about every day, but also to say that I think Dollhouse is worth being remembered. If for no other reason than to see something about the creator that he would rather keep hidden under his veneer of being a feminist icon. Still though, you probably shouldn't get into Dollhouse. There's so much I didn't get into because it would have been even more tangents, like the anti-Dollhouse senator who is actually an active created by Rossum to get themselves in government, so they would basically be writing the laws to benefit themselves. Or the way they off November after some awkward stuff between her and Paul where they give her Melly's personality again. Or the random woman Echo gets locked up by accident but then breaks out of prison through an elaborate ruse where she got a job at a hospital and got to be good enough friends with another employee that she takes her shift in the prison to break the first person out. All that happening within the space of a few months that we fast forward through and see nothing of where Echo is free from the house and is holed up with Paul training herself to access her imprints at will. Would have been super cool to see her learning to do that, but instead she learns it off screen between episodes in a time skip. If I hadn't watched it at the height of my Whedon obsession over a decade ago, I probably never would have cared to see it. And if you've watched this video all the way through and didn't go and watch it when I said to do so earlier, I would imagine you probably agree with me. I could go on for so long, but for my own well-being and mental health, I should stop thinking about this show and, I don't know, start thinking about uh, another show that I really like that uh, I'm totally not mad at all about how it ended. Thank you so much for watching. This may be the longest video I have ever done in this style. If you like this video, please click the like button and leave a comment with your favorite weird dollhouse fact, even if it's, wow, I didn't know this show existed. I'd love it if you subscribed and came back in the future to see what other old media I can talk about for a very long time. If you have something you'd like me to do a video on, tell me in a comment and I will add it to my list of possible topics. I also have a Patreon where you can get access to some of my side writing projects, gag writing projects, a few behind the scenes videos, and more. You can subscribe for as little as $2 a month at patreon.com slash writingwomen. My current patrons can be seen on screen right now. Patreon has really been a lifesaver for me this month. I contracted the plague and so spent a lot of time unable to go to work. I only work a couple of shifts a week, so missing even one throws my finances into chaos, and knowing I have income from Patreon kept me from being so stressed out I couldn't work on this while I was sick. I have moved again, hopefully for the last time in a while because moving is stressful. I'm back in an apartment though, so I'm sorry if you hear random noise from people walking by. I'm trying to soundproof where I can. Thank you for being here, constant watcher. Have a good month, and I will see you next time. Bye bye!